Bethel Church? You guys are rock and roll. And again, I want to thank Monica and, yes. and uh, Pat and some of the others who worked so hard. It was pretty amazing. I felt so out of the loop this year. I didn't really know what we were serving, what time we had to be there. And, and George kept telling me, it's okay, Pastor. You're not supposed to do everything. You just, you know, it's okay. You know? So it just shows growth in, in our church and our people that... You guys are just going on with ministry despite me, which is good. So just pass me on and keep going. Okay, don't be stuck. Okay. Praise the Lord. Everybody go. Dorothy, you're too old. Get back here. That's <laughs> cute. I want you guys to mark mark three dates on your calendars. <clears throat> August 1st, August 2nd, and August 3rd. That's all I'm gonna tell you. But mark those dates. You need to be available those three dates. Okay. I'm giving you plenty of notice. August 1st, August 2nd, and August 3rd. No excuse. I'm giving you, how many months is that? A lot of months. A lot of months. All right? <laughs> Next week, it'll be another little teaser as we lead up to August 1st, 2nd, and 3rd to let you guys know what, what's going to be happening those, those three days. But it's going to be a first for our church. And I don't want you guys to miss it. Okay? So don't even try to guess it. Don't be, is it this? Is that? No, you're not going to guess. Okay. Maybe you will. That's good. All right. We're going to continue our series on honoring God and how we can honor God. And this morning is about honoring our Father in heaven. And there's so many, you know, the world, I kept thinking about this, you know, the fathers are so important to families. But it's such a missing ingredient in families today. Either the father's not there, or he's not being the father. And it hurts. But I think one thing this morning that we can be assured of is that even though the choice of our father when we were born is made for us, there's a second chance, okay, to choose the father in heaven who will never disappoint you, who will always be there. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning is honoring our father. And, and David in the Old Testament, you know, he just couldn't stand himself. He just wanted to just honor his father so bad. You know, and we, we should be the same way. We should want to, we should just be bursting at the seams, wanting to honor our father and how we live our lives and how we speak and, and how all that we do, we should want to honor him. So let's stand. We're, we're in First Chronicles, we're in the Old Testament, chapter 29, starting at verse 10. And I want you to hear David's words this morning that we're going to speak about. It said, David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, O Lord, God of our Father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. Amen. But Lord, we just this morning, Lord, we want to pause this morning and, and honor you and, re, and be reminded of how almighty you are. Amen. And how in control you are. How much power you have. So God, help us to be reminded of these things this morning and to rely on the Lord and to choose you this morning. So God, just help us this morning to, to fall back in love with you. And God, as always, we give you all praise and all glory. Praise God. Amen. 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 You know, today we want to kind of honor God by, by thinking about Him and about, about reading about Him and about, about what He can do and what He's done and, and all these things kind of, you know, sometimes we, we, we forget. We sometimes we take it for granted and don't really stop and pause and really realize who the Almighty Father in Heaven is. And, who, and, and it, it, the thing that amazes me is Almighty God, 
God who created heaven and earth loves me. Hey. Me. Despite all my troubles, despite all my turning my back on him, despite continually not answering him, continuing to always, I'm going to be doing, I'll do this, and I never do it. He still loves me. And I think we need to be reminded of that this morning. King David couldn't contain himself when it came to his father. I don't think we should either this morning. We, we need to boast about it, talk about it, live it out in our life. So the first thing that we need to be reminded of is our Father is Almighty. In 2 Corinthians 6.18 it says, I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. You're a son and a daughter. What a dad to have. Wow. You ever been like wish, wish that somebody else was your dad? You, know, you see all they have or how they love their kids so much or how they've done this or how they've done that. Do you ever feel that way when you grew up? Or maybe this morning for some of you young, for some of you young ones. But I tell you, the Lord God Almighty will never disappoint you. Amen. And he'll always be there for you. Anything you need, He's there for you. He's going he's to have it there for you. But how has He displayed Himself to us? How has He done that? And I think about his, his, his limited, limitless imagination and the, and the design that he has through, through creation. Just look, at, just look around and see what he's created in the world that he's created. In Genesis 1.16 it says he made the stars also. He demonstrated his power when he used a single stone and a trusting teenager to defeat a gloating Goliath. He showed his power when an old prophet prayed a short prayer, 63 words, and the fire came down from heaven and completely consumed and sacrificed all that it rested on, proving to Israel that there is a God in heaven and his name is not Baal. He's the source of all power, from the multiplying of the molecule to the farthest reaches of the universe. He's the beginning and the end of all power. And he cannot tire. We have you get tired. He never tires. When he uses power, he loses none. He never needs to be refreshed or renewed. He never needs a vacation. Wow. He never tires of his needy children. He never grows weary of his responsibilities. He's our God and he is our Father. And it's still the power that he had then is still available to you today, as it was. Look at creation. I mean, I look at I look at my grand my grandbaby and the gift of that child. Wow, what a gift! How about when he prevented manna for Israel, or when he told the lepers general to dip in the Jordan, or when he made the lame to walk and the blind to see and the deaf to hear? All those things. And thousands of hungry were fed with five loaves and two fish. His strength pours out to you, and it does not diminish. Much like the widow who poured the oil and filled one pitcher, then another, then another, and the oil continued. But what does this mean for you and for me this morning? I want you to get, if you get anything from this morning, I want you to get. It means there's nothing. Say that again for me. There, there is nothing. 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 nothing that your Almighty Father can't handle in your life this morning. There is nothing that He can't handle. Maybe it's sickness. Maybe it's finances. Maybe it's a relational problem. Maybe it's a this, 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 this sins that keep happening over and over and over. There's nothing in the history of my, mankind that God cannot handle. Amen. Because He is our God, our Father, the Almighty. And He loves you that much this morning. Our Father is also long-suffering, which means He's patient in spite of even, even the troubles that are going on. In Psalm 86.15 it says, But you, O Lord, are compassionate.
compassionate and a gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. See, he's long-suffering when Adam and Eve disobeyed him in the garden, when Abraham and Sarah laughed at the promise of a son, when Israel rejected him and chose other gods, and one of his own denied his only begotten son with curses three times. What does this mean for you and for me this morning? It means he's a patient, he's gonna be patient with you, and that his love can never, ever end. Even when maybe you have. Maybe there's been times you've been afraid to speak of it, and speak his name, or failed miserably with your temper, or reverted to your old worldly ways, or done what you said you would never do again. Isaiah reminds us in chapter 65, verse 2, All day long I have held out my hands to an obstinate people who walk in ways not good, pursuing their own imaginations. How many times have we done that? How many times have you, have you walked in your own ways, pursuing your own righteousness? And just imagine God standing there with his hands out, just almost begging for him to see him. And I think so many times that what we do in worship is we're trying to draw close to God. We don't need to because he's there already. Worship is about opening our minds and our hearts so we can experience and see that he's right there in front of us. That's what that's about. He's always there. You know, how often, just think about this, how often have you ever desired to help someone who didn't really want to be helped? Have you ever done that? You know, you try to help somebody they don't want to be helped. I kind of think that's how God is, thinks about us sometimes. He's trying to help us. His hands are reached out. He wants to do these things for us. But sometimes we don't want to help. 1 Thessalonians 5.24 it says, The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. And 2 Thessalonians 3.3 it says, But the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. And how grateful we should be that God's position towards us is based on his own ability to accomplish that which we could never accomplish. You can't, you can't do it on your own. You can't. It's impossible. And many of you struggle and try and run out of energy and you just keep trying your own way. And the Father's standing there with his hands open, just waiting for you to turn to him and to rely on him and his power and his righteousness. <coughs> Our Father is righteous and just also. In Genesis 18.25, Abraham complained, proclaimed, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? <coughs> Well, does this mean that my Father is never merciful? Is that what that means? No, it doesn't. It means that He is merciful and just in a righteous, consistent way. Not because of personal whim or influenced by personal feelings. How many times do we get swayed by how we feel? Sometimes we get swayed, we don't think God is there because we don't feel Him. It's not about feeling Him, it's about knowing Him. Amen. And so many of us get drawn off and, and, and move away from it because, well, I just don't feel it anymore. I don't feel the spirit anymore. I don't feel it mm -hmm. It's not a feeling. It's a knowing and believing. That's what it is. I've had some leave the church. You say, I just, I'm not feeling it. I look at them and try to console them and try to lead them back to Christ because that's where they need to be. And, and when you're obedient to Christ and obedient to the Father, guess what happens? It all kind of lines up again. And that feeling you desire, you know what, a lot of times it comes back to you. But it's not the feeling that we're after, it's the knowing and the truth and believing and holding and trusting Him. And that's what God wants from us this morning. And He's in the... He's just, I just keep picturing that verse of him just holding his hands out. And that's just busy going back and forth, never even seeing him. Walking past him. And many times we probably walk past him and wonder, where is God right now? 
Why isn't he here? Why isn't he giving me a job? Why hasn't he cured me? Why hasn't he? Why hasn't he? Why hasn't he? Because you haven't seen him. You haven't allowed him to work. You haven't rested those things in his arms so he can do those things for you. And that's where that, 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 that connection, that reconnection I talked about comes back in your own personal life. And I don't know about you, but I love a God who is not you know, influenced by every little little thing that happens. But he's consistent. Yeah, he's he, he's 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 merciful, but he also, you know, he he he's he's gonna show us the way. And sometimes we don't want to hear the way. But we need to be obedient to him. Just imagine if God said, Well let's just let everybody go to heaven. How would this world be? That would happen. Thought about that question too this week. In Psalm 89 14, it says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne, and love and faithfulness go before you. In 85 10, it says, Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Wow. Let's look at some scripture that might help us understand both of those. In Romans 6.23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And this verse demonstrates both justice and mercy of our Father. His sin is a price. We all, we all are sinners. We need to realize that. We're all sinners. None of us are, are, are righteous. We're all sinners. And justice must be met because of the the unequality of man. And we don't measure up to God's standard of righteousness. We don't. A lot of us walk around like we do, but we don't. And a price must be paid for our righteousness. And how many of us try to pay that price? I'm going to work harder. I'm going to pray harder. I'm going to do more. I'm just going to... You can't pay it. Amen. In Romans 5, 6, you see, just at the right time, when, they were, when we were still powerless... Christ died for the ungodly. The price has been paid. In 5 8 it says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died. That's how much our Father in heaven loves you this morning. And he sacrificed his son on your behalf so that you could have salvation. That, 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 that gift of grace that can only come from Him, that you can't, you can't do nothing for it, but to love and trust Him. That's all you can do. And accept it. And again, we see both the justice and mercy of God. The justice equals sin that must be paid for, and the mercy is that Christ died for us. See, our Father is also loving. In 1 John 3, 1, it says, How great is the love of, of the Father who is lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that, it was, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that they do not know Him. I love that part. How great is the love of the Father has lavished on us. How many would love to be lavished on Wow. I was lavished on yesterday. Got a chance to take a ride to the mountains. Got a chance to take Donna's little car on a dirt road. She was freaking about that one dirt road. Sower! Don't make that water bottle! Yeah. But you know what? He's, he, he knew my heart. And we came out of this one road and we're going, well, we could go back home through, through Redlands and get back at 2 o'clock or... That's only 29 miles to Big Bear. <laughs> and I just love driving through the mountains and pulling off a road and going down. I just love all that. And God lavished on me yesterday. And he gave me that yesterday. I got to be with some good friends and we had lunch and I had a great time. And I got Donna home exactly when she needed to be home. She's off home by 6.30. <laughs> I 
About 6.15, we went into the, to the driveway. I got home even early. But see, God lavished on me. He knew the desires of my heart. He loved me so much, he wanted to give me, he wanted to show me his, his beauty of the, of the mountains and the, and, the, and the cool air and being around good friends. And That's what I think about when I think God lavishes on me. That's one of the things I think he does for me. And he'll do that for you and the things that you that you like and you enjoy. He wants to lavish you. He loves you. He wants you to be happy. He wants you to enjoy life. But you know, there's some that say, where is God's love when I go through the storms of life? Where is it? I keep picturing that one verse. He's standing right there with his arms open, waiting for you to see him and acknowledge him. In Isaiah 43, 1 and 2, it says, But now, this is what the Lord says, He who, he who created you, O Jacob, He who has formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. And when, I, when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Wow. Nothing can touch you. Because Almighty God is in love with you this morning. If you just fall into his arms and allow him to do that. In one sense, we could say that God loves us too much to keep us from the storms. And because he loves us, you know what? He can't leave us in the storm. You're going to go through them. You are. You might be going through one this morning. You might be right in the middle of it right now. And just pray that you'll just fall into his arms this morning and allow him to comfort you and give you hope and encouragement that he needs. And once you do that, it is amazing how he begins to work. This thing starts coming out of the woodwork. One of the friends that were with us yesterday who needs a job pretty bad. We were talking about that a little bit, and boy, it wasn't even 10 miles down the road as we began to talk about it. All these ideas started coming together. Oh, yeah, you can do this, maybe do that, and try there, do this, do that. That's God working. That's God taking care of you during those times that aren't, aren't so great. But that person is holding on to God, the Almighty Father. They're resting in His arms. See, He can't do those things for you if you keep walking by Him and not seeing Him. You gotta stop and rest in his arms. I think it's because of God's love that he led his people out of the wilderness and into the promised land. And if he didn't love them, he would have led them into the into conflict and they were that they were about to face. But he knew that he would lead them through the conflict, not just into it. And that's what he wants to do in your life. Years ago, there was a naval officer and his wife were at sea in a raging storm. Seeing the frantic look in her eyes, the experienced seaman tried un unsuccessfully to subdue her fears. When she grabbed his arm and cried, how can you be so calm in such a storm? He drew his sword and said, are you afraid? Without hesitation, she said, of course not. Well, why not, he inquired. He said, because I know that the sword is in the hand of my husband, and he loves me too much to hurt me. The man replied, remember, I too know who I believe. And he's the one who holds the winds in his fists and the waters in the hollow of his hands. Who are you holding on to this morning? Who are you leaning on this morning? One of the most well-known verses of all times helps us understand the love of our Father. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have Amen. eternal life. Amen. See, when you were born, you didn't get a chance to choose your Father, but this morning, you have a chance to choose your Heavenly Father. Amen. The Almighty God, he's standing here this morning, just waiting for you to fall into his arms. A child was once trying to quote John 3.16 in the King James Version, which says, His only begotten son. But the child misquoted it and said, His only forgotten son. It's one of those slips of the tongue that carried more truth than we could care to admit. 
Well, by most people in the world today, Jesus Christ is, is truly forgotten. His life is forgotten. His love is forgotten. His sacrifice is forgotten. It's our job as Christians, as God's ambassadors, to help them remember that. Amen. And hope we remind you of that this morning. Let me end with this story. Joe was a drunk. And miraculously in a street outreach mission. Before his conversion, he gained a reputation as a, as a derelict and a <coughs> wino kind of a guy for whom there was no hope. But following his conversion for Christ, everything changed. Joe became the most caring person at the mission. He spent his days there doing whatever needed to be done. There was never ever anything that he was asked to do that he considered beneath him. Whether it was cleaning up the vomit left on from some sick alcoholic or scrubbing toilets after men had left them filthy, Joe did it all with a heart of gratitude. He could be counted on to feed any man who wandered in off the streets. Andres would tuck him into bed and he was too out of, out of it to take care of himself, Joe would. And one evening after the mission director delivered his evangelistic message to the usual crowd of, of men who had drooped heads, one of them looked up came down to the altar and kneeled to pray, crying out for God to help him change. The repentant junk kept shouting, Oh God, make me like Joe! Make me like Joe! <coughs> make me like Joe. The director leaned over and said, Son, wouldn't it be better if you prayed, Make me like Jesus? Amen. <coughs> And after thinking for a moment, the man looked up at the inquisitive ex expression on his face and asked, Is he like Joe? <laughs> and what a great story, what a powerful way that we should live. And this morning, are you living your life in such a way that you're reminding people of the only forgotten son? And that the Father, our almighty Father in heaven, loves you. Let's go ahead and stand. I don't know if you realize how much God loves you this morning. Max Lucado wrote, wrote these words. There are many reasons God saves you and brings glory to himself, to appease his justice, to demonstrate his sovereignty. But one of the sweetest reasons God saved you is because he's fond of you. He likes having you around. He thinks you're the best thing to come down the pike in quite a while. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. If he had a wallet, your photo would be in it. He sends you flowers every spring and a sunrise every morning. Whenever you want to talk, he'll listen. And he can live anywhere in the universe. And he chooses your heart. Amen. This morning, he's standing there with his arms wide open, just waiting for you to fall into his arms. If every head bowed this morning, just look up your hand. If, if this morning, I don't, I don't know what's going on, but this morning, you just want to fall into his arms for whatever reason. Just slip your hand up so I can pray for you this morning. Amen. Amen. Well, Lord, we just thank you, Jesus, for who you are. We thank you for the all. Father in heaven that would send us his son and the love that he has so much for us that he would sacrifice him on our behalf. We praise you for that. And my prayers for those this morning who raise their hands that right now, whatever's on their mind, whatever's troubling, and whatever hope they need, I pray right now, Lord, that they'll pray that prayer to you and, and just fall into your arms and allow you, Lord, to love them the way that you want to. always be reminded of who the Father in heaven is and that we all have a choice and we can choose him so God go with us this week Lord help us to glorify your name in all that we do Lord and as always we give you all the praise and we give you all the glory and all God show up and say Amen